and an opportunity perhaps for questions to be asked. We might raise the question right at the beginning, why study the offerings? After all, according to Hebrews, we find that they were types and shadows. And now that we have the reality in Christ, the question might be raised, why occupy ourselves with those things which were only a shadow of good things to come? <clears throat> well, I believe there is good reason to study the offerings because, as with many things in the Old Testament, there are details given which, when they are viewed in the light of New Testament truth, give us a deeper and a fuller and a richer understanding of that New Testament truth. In addition, many principles that are given to us in the New Testament are illustrated by incidents and stories given to us in the Old Testament, and so they can be of great value to us. We do, of course, need to get our principles from the New Testament, but then the illustration of those principles often comes through the Old Testament. And so the study of the offerings is not a waste of time. It is not going over that which is in one sense lesser than what we have in the New Testament. Yes, in one sense it is, because none of these offerings can give the full display of all that was present in Christ's work on Calvary's cross. That's why we need a number of offerings. <clears throat> no one offering can give the whole picture of what our blessed Lord did on Calvary's cross. And so with that little introduction, let's go into the first offering that is given to us and this is in Leviticus chapter 1, the burnt offering. <clears throat> we might mention before we begin reading that the thought of a burnt offering is not new to the law. We find, and we don't need to turn to these scriptures, that Abel brought what is clearly a burnt offering the first offering, I believe, that was offered that was pleasing to God. And so we find that it is mentioned there. We find later on that Noah offered burnt offerings after the flood. We find that Abraham offered burnt offerings. We find that Job offered what are described as burnt offerings. Yes, the truth concerning them was not given out in the beginning, although it's remarkable just as a matter of notice, and we will see this in connection with more than one offering, that Abel offered the fat of his offering. God gave him that intelligence to offer especially the fat of the animal, and we will see in a little while what that meant. <clears throat> so the thought of a burnt offering was not new to the law, but the law expanded on it and gave very specific instructions concerning the burnt offering. Let's read it together, Leviticus chapter 1. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish, he shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord, and the priests, Aaron's sons, 
shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the altar, upon the fire rather, and the priests, Aaron's son, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. <clears throat> And if his offering be of the flocks, namely of the sheep or of the goats, for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it a male without blemish, and he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. And he shall cut it into his pieces with the head and his fat. And the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. But he shall wash the inwards and the legs with water. And the priest shall bring it all and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. <clears throat> And if the burnt sacrifice for his offering to the Lord be of fowls, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or of young pigeons. And the priest shall bring it unto the altar and wring off his head and burn it on the altar. And the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. And he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east part by the place of the ashes. And he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar, upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. <clears throat> If we notice in the first five chapters of Leviticus, we find that there were four main offerings, but five in total. The burnt offering, the meat, or perhaps more accurately, the meal offering, the peace offering, or perhaps the offering of prosperity, perhaps more accurately, and then the sin offering. But then, as an addition, we find the trespass offering, which was really part of the sin offering, although distinctive from it. But we find that those offerings can be divided into two groups, which are very instructive for our souls. We find that the first three offerings, the burnt offering, the meat offering, and the peace offering, were what might be called voluntary offerings or sweet savor offerings. They were offered of the voluntary will of the offerer. He didn't have to offer them. <clears throat> he did it of his own will for his acceptance. When it says there in verse three, he shall offer it of his own voluntary will. In the Darby translation, that reads, for his acceptance. We find then that the final two offerings, the sin and the trespass offerings, were what might be called obligatory offerings. They had to be offered. Sin was in question and in order that the sin might be forgiven and put away in the sight of God, the sin offerings were necessary. Very, very important to see that. And so the first three offerings 
the voluntary offerings, we might say, speak of worship. They speak of worship. The final two offerings, the sin and trespass offerings, speak of the putting away of sin. <clears throat> so why is the burnt offering mentioned first? As some have noted, if you and I had been writing this, we would probably have put the sin offering first. Because when you and I come to Christ, we come as lost, guilty sinners. And in order that that sin might be put away, we require Christ as our sin offering. We require the blood of Christ to put away that sin. But God does not look at things that way. Because when God did a work through his beloved son on Calvary's cross, there was first of all that which was for God's sight and God's appreciation alone. And that is a very precious thing to see. We might mention and it's a very important thing to notice that when the gospel was first preached after the day of Pentecost by the apostles like Peter and John and Philip and others who were instrumental in going out with the gospel, they did in fact, for the most part, begin with man's need. Yes, they mentioned the resurrection of Christ, that was important. But they began with the fact that you are guilty before God, but here is the remedy for it. <clears throat> but when the Apostle Paul comes out with his gospel, um, why all, over, all over. When the Apostle Paul comes out with his gospel, he starts not with man's need, but with God's glory in his beloved son and in the work that he did. Paul starts off, and we won't turn to it, but if you read the first chapter of the book of Romans, you find that Paul starts out with God's glory in his beloved son, the glory of God as exhibited in that one. It's the gospel, as we get it in 2 Corinthians 4, of the glory of Christ. Yes, it is also the gospel of the grace of God. Thank God for that. We get that, and the Apostle Paul mentions it in the 20th chapter of Acts. But in 2 Corinthians 4, it says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. And this is according to the way it is in the Darby translation. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That is burnt offering character. We might mention, as an interesting sideline, that the Gospel of John gives us, perhaps, the burnt offering character. All through the Gospel of John, you see the burnt offering character of the Lord's sacrifice. That's why, for example, you don't find the Garden of Gethsemane in John's gospel. It's interesting because John was the only writer of the gospels who was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and yet he's the only one who doesn't mention it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, although they were not there, all mention it and bring out the details. John does not mention in his gospel the three hours of darkness. Why? Because he brings out 
the burnt offering character of Christ. He brings out that that sacrifice was primarily for God. <clears throat> when the Lord Jesus offered himself up without spot to God, he did not do it, if we can say it reverently, first and foremost, for your salvation and mine. No, first and foremost, it was his willing obedience to the Father's will that was manifested. And as a sweet savor, that voluntary offering up of himself without spot to God as the perfect Lamb of God, the one who in absolute perfection in his pathway through this world proved who he was, proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that he was the eternal Son of God come down to earth as man. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2 says, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And it was as such that he goes to Calvary's cross and offers himself up without spot to God. That is the burnt offering. But the appreciation of that is a most wonderful thing. And we will get that as we go on. Let's look for a moment at some of the details of the bird offering. <clears throat> we find that a man could bring that offering of his own voluntary will. And it mentions, first of all, verse 3, if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. Oh, how important that was. There could be no possible blemish in that blessed one. And the Lord Jesus Christ, as we said a moment ago, exhibited that in his perfection in his walk down here. He could openly challenge those around him and say, which of you convinceth me of sin? And no one took up that challenge because no one could convince that blessed one of sin. But it went beyond that. It says he did know sin, but it also says in 1 John, in him is no sin. That wicked doctrine which says the Lord Jesus could have sinned, that says he was capable of sin but did not give into it, is a wicked doctrine. It is not possible. He did not have a sinful fallen nature so that not even one sinful thought ever passed through his mind. No blemish. <clears throat> And the man offers it for his acceptance. That's the proper rendering in verse 2, or rather verse 3. He shall offer it for his acceptance at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and he shall put his hand upon the head of the bird offering. Now here's something very, very precious. Pardon me. <clears throat> whether it is a sweet savor offering or whether it is a sin offering, in each case, the offerer was identified with the sacrifice. But there was a vast difference between the two types of offerings. In the sweet savor offerings, when the offerer laid his hand upon the head of the offering, all of the sweet savor of the offering 
was transferred to the offerer. What does that bring out? Oh, it brings out a very precious truth. And this is so important that I'd like to turn to the New Testament rendering of it. Turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 13. The book of the Acts chapter 13. <clears throat> And I'm going to read this from the Darby translation. If you don't have one, you can follow it in the King James and notice the slight difference. Verses 38 and 39 of Acts 13. Be it known unto you, therefore, brethren, that through this man remission of sins is preached unto you. Now that is what Peter and John and Philip and all the other apostles preached right after the day of Pentecost. But verse 39 is purely Paul's ministry, a revelation that Paul got from a risen Christ in glory. Verse 39, and from all things from which she could not be justified in the law of Moses, notice the phrase here, in him, everyone that believes is justified. Paul got that precious revelation from a risen Christ in glory. That every true believer is in Christ. We are seen in all of the acceptance of Christ himself. All of the sweet savor of Christ was transferred to the offerer. So that the offerer, you and I now, stand before God in all the perfection and acceptance of Christ himself you know with the sin offering it went in the opposite direction and we'll cover this again when we get to the sin offering but when the offerer identified himself with his sin offering all of the sin of the offerer was transferred to the offering and then when the offering was burnt all of the sin of the offerer was taken upon the head of the sin offering and exhausted with it. Quite a difference. With the sweet savor offerings, the transfer went from the offering to the offerer. With the sin offering, the transfer went from the offerer to the offering. <clears throat> He was accepted and we too, as Paul brings out in his ministry, are now accepted in the beloved. We'll stop there for a moment. Does anyone have a question? Perhaps a quick question because we don't want to, if we could use the term, derail the course of the meeting by a whole series of questions. But is there anything that is not clear or anything perhaps that anyone wishes to raise that might be cleared up in a short answer? Well, I'm very thankful for that. Let's go on then. It says in verse 5, And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord. Death had to come in. The sweet savor offering included. 
And the priest had to bring the blood. And it says, sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Oh, without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission. And so that blood had to be sprinkled round about upon the altar. This was what was called the altar of burnt offering that stood out in the court of the tabernacle. The blood had to be sprinkled there as a token that the life of the sacrifice had been taken and the blood was there as a sign before God that he could pass over the sin. But then it says in verse 6, <clears throat> And he shall flay or skin the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces. Now we will get to that later on as to the significance of this, because it is noticeable that in the burnt offering, the skin of the offering was taken off. In the case of the sin offering, it specifically mentions that the skin was burnt as part of the sin offering. We won't go into that now because the significance of the skin is part of what might be called the law of the burnt offering. And that's given to us further on in chapter seven. We will come back to this later, but only to notice here that the skin was taken away. And there was more than one reason for that. But as far as the sacrifice was concerned, it displayed that not only was that sacrifice perfect, if we could say it on the outside, but also on the inside. You and I can present one side outwardly to people with whom we come in contact, to our social contacts, to the world around us, even to our loved ones and families. But what's on the inside? The skin was taken away in order to show that the perfection was not only on the outside, but also on the inside. Then we find that it was cut into his pieces. What does that mean? <clears throat> I would suggest once again that all the perfection of the animal had to be totally displayed. It was not even burnt as one whole animal. Yes, it was totally burnt, all of it, but not all in one piece. Everything was openly displayed. And then we find that the fire was lit, the wood put on the fire, and it says in verse 8, And the priest's Aaron's son shall lay the parts, the head and the fat, in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. The head speaks of that which controls everything, the intelligence. The fat speaks. And we mentioned that earlier in connection with Abel's sacrifice. The fat speaks of the inner energy of the animal, the stored up energy of the animal, which it has and which it can fall back upon if necessary. And the fat always spoke of that which was for Jehovah alone. The Israelites, you will recall, perhaps were forbidden to eat the fat. They were not to eat the fat in any part of an animal which they slaughtered for food. That was totally for Jehovah. It spoke of that which was inward, that which was the inner energy. Energy for what? Energy in this case speaking of willing obedience to the Father's will. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus offered himself up, as we said earlier, without spot to God. And it was that willing obedience which he displayed, which 
the fat speaks of. Verse 9, but his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water. Once again, the inwards would speak of that which was the inner functioning of the animal. The legs would speak of its walk. All of that with what was washed with water. And what would it have displayed? It would have displayed the fact that there was absolute perfection there. Normally now, of course, the type here breaks down because even though the Israelite might have picked an animal that was absolutely without blemish as far as he could see, inevitably, perhaps, when he washed those legs, there might have been some impurity on it that came off in the washing. Not so in the antitype of this sacrifice in our blessed Lord. In his walk was nothing but absolute perfection. You and I in our walk need what is called in Ephesians 5, the washing of water by the word. And that is displayed for us by our blessed Lord in the 13th chapter of John. And we don't have time to go into that today. But our blessed Lord and Master never needed, if we could say it reverently, the washing of water by the word. There was absolute perfection in him. His inwards, his legs, his head, the fat, everything spoke of that which was absolutely without blemish. But then what happens? <clears throat> The latter part of verse 9, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Notice here, and we'll see the contrast with some of the later offerings. None of this offering was for the priest or the people. The only thing we will find out later that the priest received who conducted the offering was the skin. And we will see the significance of that later on. But no one other than the skin, other than the priest who got the skin, got any part of this offering. It was all totally for the Lord. And it brings before us, as we said earlier, Christ offering himself up without spot to God. We might take a moment, if we can, to reflect on that. What does that mean to you and to me? A practical point which is important to see. If you and I as believers approach God mainly from the side of the sin offering, it is most blessed and it's wonderful to appreciate that wonderful wonderful to come to christ and to see that that tremendous load of sin which i am made to feel in the presence of god has been forever put away through the blood of christ and through him as my sin offering but if my thoughts never go any further than that it tends to promote in my mind a focus on self. It tends to make God look as a benefactor, if I can use the term as a philanthropist, who is there to meet my needs. First of all, to cleanse me from all sin. And secondly, to look after all the problems and difficulties in my life the one to whom I can go with every difficulty and every need and to find that he is ready and available and able to meet every need. And all of that is blessedly true. But there is something beyond that. There is something far beyond that. And that is to come to Christ and see that whole sacrifice not particularly from my side, first of all, but from God's side. 
to see the perfection of Christ in the sight of a holy God, to see the Father's appreciation and the glory exhibited in his beloved Son offering himself up without spot to God. And then, what does that do to me? Oh, it takes me out of myself into God's view of the cross, and it enables me to say to God as my Father, here I am, <clears throat> and I want in my life to look after Christ's interests in this world. I want to see him honored and glorified. I want to see his name glorified. That's the way the Apostle Paul looked at it. What did he say about himself? He said that Christ might be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Yes, he did go to the Lord at one stage in his life and ask that his thorn in the flesh, or more accurately, a thorn for the flesh, might be taken away. And the Lord refused that request because he knew that Paul needed that thorn, just as you and I sometimes need one. But Paul in the main was one who said, it doesn't matter what becomes of me, as long as my blessed Lord and Master is honored and glorified, and as long as his interests are looked after. How wonderful to see the cross from God's side and not merely from our own. That is the burnt offering character. <clears throat> Well, let's go on. We find the next is a sheep or a goat, somewhat lesser of an animal as to size, but yet we find the instructions are basically the same. The animal is killed, the head and the fat are sacrificed, the legs and the inwards are washed in water, and the whole thing is offered. All of the animal, every bit of it except the skin, is offered and goes up to God as a sweet savor unto the Lord. <clears throat> but then we come at the last here to the turtle dove and the young pigeons. <coughs> Excuse me. And we find here a very significant difference. First of all, a turtle dove or a pigeon. How does that compare to a bullock? Oh, what a difference. Tremendous difference in size. And when you compare it even with a sheep or a goat, again, a huge difference in size. <coughs> but there's something else noticed here. We find that in verse 15, it is the priest who kills the animal. The offerer did that in both cases whether with a bullock or a sheep. Here it is, the priest that does it. That is, the offerer perhaps did not have quite the ability or the understanding to enter into the significance of the offering the way the one did who offered a bullock or a goat. So it's the priest that has to ring off the head of this turtle dove or pigeon. And the priest is the one <clears throat> who has to do some further details. What does he have to do? It says in verse 16, and he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers 
and cast it beside the altar on the east part by the place of the ashes. What does that mean? We have to enter in a little bit into the way a bird's digestive system functions. And it's well known that when a bird takes in food through its mouth, it goes into what is called its crop. And in that crop, that food can sit for a little while before the bird is ready to transfer it to what is called a gizzard, which has little tiny stones in it of varying sizes, depending on the size of the bird. And it is the work of those stones grinding away with the muscles in that gizzard that digests that food so that it can be assimilated into the bird's bloodstream and provide energy for it. <clears throat> so the crop, in essence, holds undigested food. That would speak perhaps of that which is brought as an offering to the Lord, which we may have learned of Christ, but perhaps it's only what we might call head knowledge. Perhaps we haven't meditated upon it and walked in the good of it so that we have really made it our own. It is what we might call spiritually undigested food. That had to be laid to one side. It had to be put there on the east side of the altar with the ashes. That was where that went, which was later going to be taken out and thrown away in a place <clears throat> outside the camp. It could not be part of the offering. But then the feathers had to be taken off. You know, if you have ever had to do with plucking a dead bird. I grew up on a farm and I became accustomed to this kind of thing, uh, as most farmers do, especially if you keep chickens. When you kill a chicken, you have to pluck it in order to be able to roast it and eat it. And when all the feathers are taken off that bird, oh, it is much smaller than it looks with the feathers on it. The feathers speak of that which is outward show. And sometimes, you know, we may bring that to the Lord, especially in the presence of others. That is perhaps done as outward show for others. Expressions may be used, things may be said, which <clears throat> are really to impress others, even though we might not want to admit it but I am the first one to admit that I have been guilty of that. Those feathers had to be taken off and they too had to be cast on the east side of the altar with the ashes. But then what happens to the rest of the bird? It's divided asunder, <clears throat> divided asunder, not completely. It reminds us of what we get in Genesis 15, concerning Abraham, where he divided a number of animals asunder. And once again, the interior of that animal was laid bare so that the perfection could be seen, perhaps not to the degree that we had with the bullock or the sheep and the goat, but at least the inwards were laid bare in order that it might be seen that the inward perfection was the same as the exterior. And once again, all was burnt on the altar. But no matter what size the sacrifice was, bullock, sheep or goat, or turtle dove or pigeon, it's beautiful to see that in God's eyes, it says exactly the same thing about it. <clears throat> it is a burnt sacrifice an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. 
Each offering spoke of Christ. Each was pleasing to God. Each was a sweet savor which arose up before him. And there's one other point that we'd like to make here. And anyone can look this up. <clears throat> when it comes to the sin offering that was burnt outside the camp, we find that the Hebrew word used for burning there is a general word used for burning that might be used for any kind of burning, whether it would be uh, uh, burning wood or uh, burning a house down or anything like that that was burnt. <clears throat> it's a general word for burning. But when it comes to the sweet savor offerings, especially the burnt offering, the Hebrew word used for burning is a different word. It's the same word as is used in connection with burning incense on the altar of incense in the holy place in the tabernacle. It's a word that specifically has the sense of burning something with a view to causing a fragrance to come forth. <clears throat> we know that that occurs in nature. We know that there are certain things in nature when they are burned that give off a nice fragrance that we like to smell. Equally true, we know that there are things in nature which when they are burnt, give off a very offensive odor. But this word used for burning in the case of the burnt offering is one that is specific for burning something with a view to causing a fragrance to come forth. Well, we have a few minutes where we might make a few more practical applications, but we'll stop here once again and ask if anyone has a question on what we have covered so far. Feel free to bring it up. Again, I say perhaps not a long question. If it's rather involved, we might save that for a little bit and we'll make time for that. But does anyone have something that could be answered in relatively short order that might clear up something that perhaps is not very, uh, shall we say, clear at the moment? <clears throat> Brother Bill, um, we often think of atonement in connection with, I think, the sin and trespass offerings. But I was just noticing in verse 4 that atonement is brought into connection with this offering as well. Could you, do you have a little something on that? At the end of verse 4, it says, to make atonement for him? Yes. I believe the word atonement here, at least for my own soul, has a slightly different meaning than it does in connection with the sin offering. The word <clears throat> atonement is used in a proper translation only in the Old Testament. You don't find it in the New Testament except once. And there it's a mistranslation in Romans 5, <clears throat> where it says, through whom also we have received the atonement. And the word there should read reconciliation. Because the word atonement, strictly speaking, means to cover. And that was what the Old Testament sacrifices did. They covered but did not fully do away with sin. But here I believe the word atonement has a different thought. I believe, as we said earlier, it brings before us that <clears throat> the offerer was accepted before the Lord, and in that sense he was covered by the offering but not in the same sense of the sin offering. The, the sin offering covered him, 
in the sense of the blood covering his sin. Here, I believe it was the sense of the offerer being identified with the offering as <clears throat> a sweet savor offering so that the offerer was covered as it were with the sweet savor of the offering. But there's another thought that we could bring in here too and I'm indebted to one of our old writers for this and if any are interested you can look it up. Uh, <clears throat> I might say this and perhaps I don't mean to cast a slur or shall I say uh, downgrade if I could use the term any of the other writers who write on the tabernacle but there's a book which I believe is still available entitled Foreshadows and the author of that book is a man by the name of Pressland E. C. Pressland, and in my judgment, that book, Foreshadows, is probably the best book that has ever been written on the tabernacle. Others like Soltau and various others have gone into it in perhaps greater detail, but E. C. Pressland seemed to have <clears throat> the deepest insight into the meaning of things and he also takes up in that book the offerings and he makes a comment which I believe is very significant. He says that <clears throat> whenever a sin is committed before God and there have been plenty of sins since the uh, first sin in the Garden of Eden he said, not only is that sin <clears throat> before God, that which has to be wiped away, but he said it is also the insult that that sin brings into the realm of things which God set up. It was an insult to God that man dared through the influence of Satan to bring sin into God's creation. And that insult remains. <clears throat> what happens with the burnt offering? The Lord Jesus comes into the world. And what do the angels say at his birth? And again, I'm quoting from the Darby translation. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good pleasure in man. Here at last was an object in a world that had been spoiled by sin, had been desecrated by the hand of Satan through man, and yet finally the eye of God can rest on a man who comes into this world and whose entire life rises up to God as a sweet savor. That is what the Lord Jesus did. He reversed, if you could say, the insult that was offered to God. And <clears throat> Pressland points out that that is another blessed meaning of the word atonement here. That is, the sweet savor covered the insult that man through the devil made, or the devil through man made to God. <clears throat> by bringing sin into the world. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for raising the point because uh, it would have been good if I had covered that, but sometimes every little thing doesn't come to your mind and uh, uh, I'm not boasting, but I don't tend to speak from notes. I feel freer without them. So sometimes some little thing gets passed by. Bill, is there any indication in this uh, 
section as to who, what is the difference between the people who would offer the bullock or the lamb or the bird? I think it's three different offerings. And is there any indication as to why a person would offer the one or the other? Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, I was coming to that, but I'm going to ask the host of our meeting what we should do. <clears throat> uh, there is the law of the offering, the burnt offering, which is given to us in chapter six and chapter seven, which will take a little bit of time and also the explanation of the differences between these three examples of the bird offering, the bullock, the sheep and the goat, and the fowls. What shall we do? Shall we go into those today or shall we leave those till another Saturday? Uh, what about it, Tom? <clears throat> Let's go ahead, Bill, and... Um and leave it for the next day. Is, is that okay then? Uh, That's fine. I, I can't cover that in five minutes. Okay. No I, I, is, uh, uh, and uh, I was coming to that and I was kind of debating in my own mind, shall we go ahead with that? Because there are a number of things that can be said about it. And I think we can fill another hour next Saturday without any problem and leave time for questions. I mean, fill another hour with the law of the burnt offering and that, and then perhaps have time for a few more questions. <clears throat> That's fine with me. <laughs> I thought it was a short question. Well, there are a lot of different things can be said about it. Uh, and uh, as, as our host says, I think uh, it would be better if we left it till next week. Well, Lord willing then, if everyone is okay, I am free next Saturday. And uh, as far as I know, we'll wait for our host to uh, give us the go ahead. But the Lord willing, we can go ahead next Saturday and again pursue the uh, the burnt offering and some of the details of it. And uh, if you have more questions, that, excuse me, that come to mind, save them up, write them down. Can't promise to answer them all, but uh, we'll do our best. Let's pray. Our loving God and our Father, we just commend ourselves to thee now and thy word, praying that what is said may have been according to thy mind as revealed in thy word, and that the preciousness of all this might sink down deeper into our souls. We know, our God, that our capacities are limited, and that down here in this world, as thy word says, we see through a glass darkly, and in a coming day, face to face. <coughs> Excuse me. But we thank thee, Lord Jesus, for what we do understand. And we pray that by thy Holy Spirit, we may see more and more of all the depths of thy finished work, a work which we will never exhaust throughout all eternity. So we commend ourselves to thee, each one, and thank thee, our God, for this time together. And we do so in the precious and worthy name, that blessed one, thine own beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Do you have time for some questions, Bill? I've got the time if you have. Yes, that's no problem for me. Uh, Maybe someone else has a question. Yeah, it's not that we're skipping yours, Diana. Yours, yours is a, 
And unfortunately, yours is a big question. <laughs> That's quite all right. And, and Bill, if the questions uh, are more suitable for the next time, then just say so and we'll take them up then. Well, next time, the Lord willing, we'll take up the significance of the three different examples of the burnt offering, the bullock, the sheep and the goat, and the fowls. And then we'll take up the law of the burnt offering. And if you want to read that, it's in chapter six of Leviticus. And then in chapter seven, there's a reference to the skin of the burnt offering. And those will take a little time to develop. Uh, but uh, yes, that's what we'll try to do next week, the Lord willing. <clears throat> So if anyone has a question now, uh, feel free to raise it, other than on those subjects that I just mentioned, uh, and we'll be happy to try and answer them. <clears throat> I have a question, Brother Bill. Um, you you uh, referred to Hebrews 9 that through the eternal spirit he offered himself without spot to God in connection with the burnt offering. Is a burnt offering more properly an offering to God as God, entire Godhead, rather than the Father? And the difference between that and John 13, uh, with the Lord speaking, the hour had come that God would be glorified and would straightway glorify the Son there I've always taken it more in connection with the aspect of sin and the sin offering, but just wondering your thoughts on that. I have, let's turn to that scripture, Brother Steve. It's in Hebrews 9 that you mentioned. Uh, to me, that's so beautiful. Hebrews 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself with out spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We find in this chapter, and most of you have noticed this, that in verse 12, you get eternal redemption. In verse 14, you get the eternal spirit. In verse 15, you get eternal inheritance. Everything is eternal. But I, I like that thought, Steve, and have enjoyed it in my own soul that when Christ offered himself through the eternal spirit, it was <clears throat> not merely for the Father's glory, but for the entire Godhead. And I know it's anticipating, but, and perhaps I don't need to acknowledge always the indebtedness in these cases, but I am indebted to J.N. Darby for this remark. And to me, it was absolutely beautiful when I read it. I remember thinking, how beautiful. And it's anticipating next week. He said, uh, the priest got the skin of the burnt offering. The priest. And then he makes the remark. And again, I give JND the credit for this. He said, is that a picture of Christ's satisfaction with his own work? Mm. I don't like to use a flippant word, but when I read that, I literally said to myself, wow, there is something for the soul. Christ's satisfaction in his own work. And I believe that's all part of it here through the eternal spirit. 
The father appreciated that work. The Lord Jesus appreciated his own work. And the eternal spirit was the power by which it was all carried out. And I agree with you in John 13. We can turn to that for a moment if you like. <clears throat> John 13 and verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And then in verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, that is Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. I agree that that's glorifying him as to the whole question of sin, not merely satisfying God, but glorifying him by adding as we might say according to what we will get later in the trespass offering the fifth part to it was that your thought then yes thanks that's a help <clears throat> uh, bill i have a question in regards to what you were just mentioning there about christ being satisfied with his Work is that what Hebrews fifty three eleven is is speaking of in Sorry, Hebrews what? in Hebrews fifty three eleven would that be an example of Christ being satisfied with his work? Still didn't get the reference. Ah, Isaiah, Isaiah fifty three eleven. Oh, Isaiah fifty three. Sorry, sorry. I was trying to think where Hebrews fifty three was. <laughs> sorry. I might have said Hebrews. I'm sorry. I very well could have. <laughs> but it was Isaiah 53, 11. Was that, would that be an example of what you were referring to about what uh, Christ being satisfied with his work? Yes, I believe so. Uh, there in Isaiah 53, I believe it's looking at you and me. It's the results of his work, and he'll be satisfied with that. But it's all, sometimes the scripture gives us to see his work from different angles. There's the sense in which God was glorified in his work as to sin. That's John 13. God was glorified in another sense by that sweet savor going up to God. But then it's beautiful to think in a coming day when the Lord looks at you and me, he's going to say it was worth it. You and I know what it's like in this world to spend our money on something, a great deal of hard work maybe to earn that money or to perhaps even make something. And then later on, we have to say, oh, it wasn't worth it. If I had it to do over again, I wouldn't spend that money on it. They didn't, the product wasn't worth what I spent on it or what I ended up making didn't turn out to be worth the time and effort I put into it. I wouldn't have done it if I'd known this is the way it would happen. The Lord's not going to say that at all with regard to you and me. He's, uh, he's going, the latter part of that verse explains it. It says, and I'm going to quote as it is in the Darby translation. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant instruct many in righteousness, for he shall bear their iniquities. He instructed many in righteousness during his life. And then on the cross, he bore their iniquities. And he's going to say it's worth it. But, Bill, um, <clears throat> we don't exactly have fruit as a result of the burnt offering. 
Oh no, oh no, that's not yeah. the thought, no. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, at least in my own mind, it's, it's awfully important to keep it separate because we always are trying to run it together. And that's one of the difficulties, Doug, because in the New Testament, it's all one offering. And the Old Testament makes the distinctions. And what you say is very, very important. Yes, the fruit of his work is not strictly part of the burnt offering, but he'll be satisfied with his own work. And that's why I said, I believe it's you and me in Isaiah 53 that he's thinking about. But thank you for making that distinction because it is important. <clears throat> Brother Bill, could you could you give a little word on the difference between uh, John 10 and uh, 17 and the verse that Steve brought out in, in John 13, 31? Okay, let's read those verses together. John 10 and 17. Very precious verse. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. And then in John 13, and which verse was it in John 13, Brother Ed? The, the one that Steve uh, draw, uh, drew attention to, verse 31, where we were, we were talking about it being uh, the Godhead, the Trinity. So there's a distinction there. I'd like a, a, to hear you uh, share on that. Okay, verse 31 again. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Well, my view of those two verses is fairly simple, Brother Ed. I would look on verse 17 as being, once again, burnt offering character. Here is one who voluntarily yields up his life to the Father, <clears throat> Now, as far as the world was concerned, uh, when Peter and others in the book of the Acts spoke of the, the Lord Jesus, they spoke very clearly <clears throat> of the fact that they were his murderers, which in fact, as to their guilt, they were. But here the Lord Jesus brings in, I believe, the burnt offering character Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. And it's very significant, referring once again to John as the burnt offering gospel, that you do not even get the Lord Jesus saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. There's no reference to the Father in John's gospel. It simply says, he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And there he voluntarily dismisses his spirit. Whereas I believe as Brother Steve Stewart brought out in John 13, for my own soul, I believe it's more the sin offering character in uh, verses 31 and 32 of John 13 where God is glorified as to sin by the offering of the Lord Jesus. So I would, I would just see them simply in that way. <clears throat> Thank you. I don't want to turn this into a reading meeting, but I want to recognize others. And Brother Steve, if I could ask you, would you agree with what I just said? Do you have any comment on it? Uh, I, I agree with it. I There was an old hymn that I've enjoyed. I don't remember it all, but the first couple lines, it says, I've been to the altar and witnessed the lamb burnt holy to ashes for me and seen its sweet savor ascend up on high, accepted, O Father, by thee. 
I've just wondered in the light of uh, Hebrews 9, if it would be better accepted, oh God, by the, you know, it was for the whole Godhead that that went up. Thank you. And um, maybe you said it, Bill, but uh, to emphasize the fact, at least in my own mind, that the burnt offering is primary. You know, we think of the Lord coming to earth uh, to save us as being primary. Well, yes, and I did, I believe, mention that at the beginning of the talk, that if we had been giving the offerings out, we would have likely put the sin offering first, because uppermost in our minds would be our need and the way God meets that need. But as you say, the burnt offering is put first, because what is for God is of absolute importance. And that is given to us in the burnt offering. It's given to us in Paul's ministry. It's given to us in John's gospel in the New Testament. And as we said earlier, when Paul preaches the gospel, he does not begin with man's need. He begins with the purposes of God in Christ and how God was glorified in that blessed one. How God has in his purposes the honor and glory of his beloved son. And that was brought out in <clears throat> his going into death. Offering himself without spot to God. Glorifying God. Not necessarily for sin. But in his willing obedience to the father's will. In offering himself up without spot. Very definitely. So, Bill, uh, would it be right to say that in this, in the burnt offering, that it brings before us the fact that God not only had, the whole Godhead not only had to be satisfied, but also glorified about the whole question of sin itself? not just mine or yours, but the whole question of sin. That's the question. Well, it's kind, kind of hard to answer because, as we said earlier, it's all one sacrifice. But I don't believe that sin in that sense, is really in question with the burnt offering. Yes, you cannot separate it, and that's why the blood is mentioned here in verse 5 as being uh, poured out or sprinkled round about the altar. There had to be blood. But I don't believe sin, per se, is in question with the burnt offering. And that's why it was holy for God, all of it, and sin is not really brought in here, but rather acceptance, and you cannot properly connect sin with a sweet savor. That's the whole point. If you bring in sin, the sin offering could not be a sweet savor to God, and so in that sense, yes, God needed if I could say it, to be glorified as to sin. God was going to be glorified as to sin. And the sin offering did that because the Lord Jesus went far above and beyond what was needed, even in the sin offering. But I, I, I would not personally connect it with the bird offering because the minute you bring sin into the picture, you destroy the character of the sweet savor and vice versa. D does that make sense? <clears throat> A brother, uh, uh, Bill Ward, taught me, rightly or wrongly, that uh, the way to look at Leviticus 1 was the offering was in the place where sin was, as you said, where God was so dishonored. 
even my presence on earth in his correction in his his uh, creation was an insult because of the sin on me so the offering had to be done in the place where sin was but not for sin would that sound right excellent it was on the same altar as the sin offering went yeah. and the blood was poured out in the same place as the blood of the sin offering was and the crop and the feathers were thrown on the east side of the altar where the ashes of the sin offering were and so on and we'll find out later and again this is anticipating next week the ashes of the sin offering had to be carried outside the or, sorry the ashes of the burnt offering had to be carried outside the camp to the same place as the ashes of the sin offering went so yes it was in the same place as sin was but not for sin that, that's well put and uh, i was wondering uh, my thought about the uh, the blood uh being sprinkled in Leviticus 1 is not, it, I mean, that can't be remission of sins. That has to be just uh, proof that the offering went into death. I think that's the primary thought. Yes. Yes. Because we get it mixed up in our minds. And that's, uh, uh, to me, it's so important not to mix things up because god is is revealing something to us here for our souls that that uh, shouldn't be corrupted with our own thinking right what is the um uh, do you have a thought about the wood i don't in can sorry go, go ahead just kind of the same idea yes i don't i don't have any special thought about the wood here uh except that it was incidental to offering the offering uh generally speaking and if you look back at isaac's sacrifice the wood would speak of the perfect manhood of the Lord Jesus. But that does not so much come in here. Yeah. The perfect manhood of the Lord Jesus is rather the meat offering or the meal offering. And we'll see that in the fine flour and other things in connection with that. But I had no special thought with the wood in connection with the burnt offering, other than that the wood and the fire were necessary the wood speaking of that which kindles the fire and the fire speaking of judgment uh it was just shall we say incidental to the to the fact that the offering had to be burned up <clears throat> it, it just to suggest it seems to have the same flavor to me of the offering being made in the place where sin was you know if if there hadn't have been any sin there would have been no wood there would have been no need for fire uh you know just kind of the same flavor mm -hmm. is is uh is this and I, and if this is a can of worms bill please just shut me down <laughs> oh no is this propitiation yes yes i believe so yes Yes, I, I believe it is. Uh, it is satisfying the claims of God's holy nature. Although, once again, propitiation brings sin into the picture. But it brings sin in, in a general way. And if we could put it this way, and this is another point that perhaps could have been made, but I didn't make it. And that is, the sin offering was for specific sins. The burnt offering is rather concerned. <laughs> Excuse me. The dry air in these centrally heated houses in 
cold climates doesn't do my throat any good. The burnt offering consists or speaks more of my state. It speaks more of what I am rather than what I have done. And in that sense, it does take in propitiation, yes. Because propitiation is more the thought of sin in what it is before God. Sin in its root and its principle. And in that sense, God needed to be propitiated by a sacrifice which enabled him to come out in grace. And so, yes, in that sense, the burnt offering, I believe, brings before us our state as being sinful and with a sinful nature before God. That's the, shall we say, the uh, second half of Romans 5 and going on into Romans 6 and 7. It's what I am by nature before God, sin in its root rather than the question of sins. And Romans, of course, starts off with the question of, first of all, God's glory in Christ and his purposes in him. But then God takes up sins and how they're dealt with and then brings in sin in its root and its principle. But here, when God looks at it through his eyes with the work of Christ, he takes up the burnt offering, which is what I am more by nature in being a sinner by nature. And as you point out, Doug, that again uh, ties in with what we were saying about the insult to God just by the fact that here I am living in God's earth, a sinner by nature, an insult to God who created all things that were very good and then as a man we dared to introduce sin into that sphere <clears throat> bill doug doug mentioned fire and i was wondering if you could make a distinction between the fire of the burnt offering and the fire of the sin offering because they have two different aspects don't they Boy, we're getting into complicated things, aren't we? <laughs> yes, I believe there is a distinction because that's, and that's why, as we said earlier, the word used in Hebrews, sorry, the word used in the Hebrew language for fire in the burnt offering is different from the word used for fire in the sin offering. The fire used in the burnt offering and the word used to describe the burning of the burnt offering is a word that means primarily a fire which by its consuming of something produces a sweet fragrance. And I'm no Hebrew scholar, but anyone can look this up. The word is different in the original Hebrew. But the word used for burning the sin offering outside the camp is a word that is generally used for burning. It could be burning anything. And as we said earlier in the talk, there are things by nature which give off a fragrance when they're burned. There are things by nature that give off a rather offensive odor. And... <clears throat> The sin offering, I believe, when it was consumed, yes, that fire had to consume the sacrifice, but at the same time, it was not the same as that for the burnt offering. The, the sin offering could never, before God, be a sweet savor to God. But there's something else that we need to remember here, too, and here again, the type falls short. In any offering in the Old Testament where sin was involved, the fire consumed the offering. What happens with the true sin offering? 
the offering consumes the fire. The offering consumes the fire. And so the fire would speak in the case of the sin offering of God's righteous judgment against sin. What happens? Oh, it burns up the sin offering. <clears throat> but in reality, with the offering that our Lord made on Calvary's cross, he consumes the fire. The judgment is gone. He remains, goes into death, ascends out of the grave in power and glory and resurrection. So there is a falling short. But with the fire of the sweet savor offering, yet again, it consumed the offering. It doesn't in the reality. The Lord Jesus offered himself up without spot to God. The fire produced that sweet fragrance, but that sweet fragrance, shall we say, did not, if we could put it that way, I don't mean to mix things that differ, but the object of the fire of that sweet, let me start that again. The sweet savor produced by that fire continued to rise and the offering consumed the fire so that even that which produced the sweet savor still remains before God. His beloved son will ever be a sweet savor to him. And we'll see a little bit of this next week when we talk about the continual burnt offering. The fire was never to go out because that offering continually rises up before God as a sweet savor. I don't know, somehow, Ed, I, I may have kind of garbled that a little bit. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, that was, that was good, Bill. Uh, in, a, in a little different form, I, I've, I've enjoyed just the thought that um, the fire in, in the sweet savor offering the, the fire is consuming all of Christ in his delight in his son in every aspect of his work for his glory. So as you were saying, it goes up as a sweet smelling savor to God. Every aspect of that offering is burned up and he's enjoying it, if you will, uh, of, of, his, of his work for his glory. Whereas the sin offering is a judgment it's 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 bearing the full wrath and judgment of the of for sin uh, when when it comes to that. So it's just a simple difference. But I've enjoyed what you said. So now, Bill, you'll find out why I wanted you in the hot seat. I have one hundred more questions, so I hope you're not in a hurry. <laughs> no, just two more. Uh, what's the significance of the east side? Do you or some other brother have a, a thought as to uh, the east side of the altar? All I, all, the only thought I have had there is that I believe the tabernacle when it was set up, was supposed to face east. I believe that's the way it was supposed to face. And uh, in that sense, it would face the rising of the sun. Uh, <clears throat> what God would see when the sun rose up was that altar. But uh, I, I don't have any other special thought on it. Uh, maybe someone else does, and if so, I would be glad to hear it. Uh, but uh, I don't have any special thought on it. <clears throat> I like that, Bill. I never heard that before, the, the, the sun uh, shining on the altar, a new day. I was going to ask that same question, uh, but I thought it would be relegated to next week with Diana's question. 
because <clears throat> you come in through the door of the tabernacle on the east side and the first thing you see is that altar of burnt offering and so i wondered if in verse three with the with the bullock that you're you know it's just boom you're right there and that's where it seems like the offering took place if i have my geography right with the tabernacle but in verse uh 11 when you come down to the flock he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the lord so you would go around to the other side of the of the altar and the value of the sacrifice essentially the same the appreciation of it or we would say we come at it from a different direction and um uh, I'm not exactly sure whether it's too much of a stretch to say that, you know, in Song of Solomon, we read about the north wind and, and <clears throat> there's a way that we come to Christ as the one who has relieved us of our, of our uh, suffering and sin and our bondage. And, and so I just wonder if it's not just appreciating that uh, sacrifice from from a different direction with the flock and I, i'm not sure at all how how the priest would have handled the the bird but i've, I've wondered that about the flock thank you very much bruce that's that's very helpful and uh, maybe we could meditate a little bit on that uh, i'd like to a bit more <clears throat> Bill, I was just uh, wondering about um, John 17 and 4, when he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. What all does that include? Is that all these offerings? Like, you know, it's the burnt offering as well, but is there some thought in there as to the, com the completeness of all the offerings? I guess the way I've looked at that, Brother Ken, is an all-encompassing, uh, shall we say, comment on our Lord's work, not only on the cross, but his whole pathway down here. Mm -hmm. uh, I can still remember many, many years ago, probably 60 years ago now, a brother giving an address and... Of course, I was only a teenager then, but he made the comment concerning the Apostle Paul. He said, Paul could say, I have finished my course. He said there was only one who at the end of his pathway could say, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And to me, it's the whole course of what the Lord Jesus did, whether he healed the sick, whether he preached uh whatever he did and then what he did on calvary's cross it was all glorifying the father and he could with every confidence say i have finished the work and everything you gave me to do i've i've done it but it would certainly include everything in the offerings. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Everything we've talked about would have to be included. And of course, as a divine person, he could speak of it as to the cross before it had happened in time. Thank you. Brother Bill, could you give a little comment on Ephesians 5, verse 2, the last phrase? Well, I believe that's a reference to the burnt offering. 
We'll read it there, Ephesians 5 and verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us and offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. I believe that there is a sense, although we, at least I would be very ashamed to apply it to myself, but there is a sense in which what is of Christ in you and me that is done for God's glory does in fact rise up as a sweet smelling savor to him. Our worship rises up as a sweet smelling savor <clears throat> and we can be very thankful for the opportunity to do that and we might will mention that a little bit next week but I believe here the walk of a believer in as much as it is of Christ and according to him and done for God's glory is in fact before God a sweet smelling savor and so Christ is given to us as the example here an example so high that none of us ever rises that high but just the same God never sets anything less before us does he Brother Bill, I noticed in the animals which could be offered that they are among land and uh, land animals and birds. I, and I was thinking about this fact that there are no uh, sea animals. What would you say is the significance of that? Could it be because the sea uh, signifies the world and the Lord wasn't of the world even though he lived in the world? I must say, Sammy, that that's a question that I've never thought of. <laughs> I don't know the answer to it. The only thing I would say as a partial explanation was that, or is that land animals would be very readily available to anyone, no matter where they lived. Uh, animals from the sea or from the river especially in the wilderness when these were all given to the Israelites would perhaps not have been available to them. Now, how many sacrifices they offered in the wilderness is very questionable. Uh, the whole question is raised in Stephen's apology in Acts 7, <clears throat> uh, quoting from the Old Testament, uh, how many how many sacrifices did you offer me in the wilderness they were probably very few but it likely was the ease of availability of the uh land animals because everyone kept flocks and herds in those days and turtle doves and pigeons were easy to get so i, I don't know any other reason for it uh I agree with you that the sea tends to speak of the restlessness of the Gentile nations of the world constantly in motion and going this way and that way. But on the other hand, there were fish out of the sea that were clean, that they were enabled to eat as long as they had fins and scales. So I don't know whether I could go any further than that. I wondered if it's. Uh the fact that generally when you think of things from the sea uh, the thought of shedding of blood is not brought in uh, we know that physically yes they do have blood but scripture doesn't seem to take it up that way and I, i've never heard anybody comment on it but just in my own wondering on the same question uh if that's what's occurred to me is that you really fish would be just uh, skewered and put over the fire there was no thought of bleeding them out you know uh, like you would with an animal 
so, uh, land animal or bird. Thank you very much, Steve. I had not thought of that point, but that's very good because uh, as you know, fish are uh, not whales and things like that, but fish are what are called in zoology, poikilothermic animals. They're cold blooded and, uh, and uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Would it be too far to um, say that in the burn offering, what we have is the Lord um, seeking first the kingdom of God? Can you expand on that, Cornell? I'm not sure where you're going with that. So it was mentioned that uh, sin was an insult to God, and um, we are in God's creation. And so uh, the kingdom of God, um, as it were, was um, uh, brought, uh, sin was brought in, and therefore a defilement came in. And that when the Lord offered himself up, it was to as it were, to, he was seeking first the interest of the kingdom of God um, by offering himself up to and to put away sin. Never heard it put that way, Cornell, because the kingdom of God there is a moral condition, which, of course, God looked for and never did see in the natural man. Uh, and he saw it only in his beloved son. The Lord Jesus could say uh, uh, to the scribes and Pharisees and others, uh, uh, don't look for the kingdom of God here and there. He could say the kingdom of God, and it's a mistranslation in our King James, the kingdom of God is among you, meaning that it was embodied in his own person. And in that sense, it represented part of the perfection that he was. But seeking the kingdom of God was a command given to others. That is, they were to seek God's interests and to be God-like, if you like. It was the characteristic of his kingdom. <laughs> and then all the other things were to be, would be added unto them. <laughs> I don't know. I, I would never, I have never connected that with the burnt offering. Uh, you know. In the sense that you have, um, he says to do thy will of God is um, my delight. And so, it was when when the Lord was here, um, he was he was interested in in doing the will of the Father, whatever that that brought brought forth, and in that sense that he would be seeking to um, first the, in, the interest of the kingdom of God in manifesting God's will. Well, the only thing is, I don't think you can bring the burnt offering character into the Lord's ministry during his three and a half years on earth. <laughs> the burnt offering is really the cross. Would you say, Bill, that um, the, the burnt offering aspects, um, God did not sin, so of course there would not be the sin offering aspect, but he answered the question once and for all for the glory of God regarding the question of sin in everything that had been touched by fallen man, both in heaven and in earth. So it goes way beyond the kingdom aspect.
Yes, it, yes, it goes way beyond the kingdom aspect. What he did at the cross in the burnt offering character, yes. Well, I don't like to end this, but uh, I'm just pointing out that for, I'm afraid my voice is a little bit shot. Uh, is it okay if we leave the rest of the questions for next week? Uh, is that all right? Sounds good, Bill. Uh, let's just uh, give thanks for the nice time we've had. Lord, what a better way to spend our time as we await thy coming for us than to be occupied with thyself. We thank thee uh, for uh, the ability that we have uh, to have uh, uh, these truths opened up to us uh, to any that, uh, that is interested. Pray that thou wouldst draw our hearts, Lord Jesus, to thyself, to thy fullness. And our Father, we thank thee we've had uh, before us this morning the one that fully uh, pleased thee in every way. We thank thee, Lord Jesus, that we, we look on, as it were, afar off, and we see God pleased beyond anything that we'll ever know by thy person, by offering of thyself without spot to God. Thank thee for this time. Seek thy blessing on each one of thine own. We give thanks, Lord Jesus, in thine alone worthy name we pray. Amen. 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 Nice to see you all. Thank you, Bill. Really well, nice. Well, thank you for setting things up. You and